I've never told anyone about this, except for my family. I was driving from Worcester, Massachusetts to Hartford, Connecticut for work. It only takes about an hour and a half, but I was driving at night, and I wasn't too happy about that. I was going to stay in Hartford for a few days in a hotel. I remember my wife wasn't too happy, because we had family coming into town, and I'd miss the first day that they'd be in town. I told them that there was nothing that I could do, and that I would see them soon, and to apologize for the family for me. I reminded them it wouldn't be too long, and that it didn't take too long to get home. I filled a travel mug with coffee and got in the car. It was around 8 o'clock at night, as I had to work the next day before I left. Traffic wasn't too bad at the time, so it wasn't too bad getting out of the city. I took the 290 to the 90, and then jumped on to the 84 going south because that goes all the way through Hartford. I like driving at night, so I was okay. I had my coffee and I had the radio on, and I just kind of decompressed on the way down. You have to kind of do that, just lose yourself in the driving, and de-stress from the day or the week. A lot of people don't like the highway, but it's okay as long as you're paying attention. It happened when I was getting close to Nipmuc State Forest. I had been there before, even brought my family there, but we just stopped going after this. It started to rain a little, just like a lazy drizzle, nothing too heavy or anything. I had the windshield wipers on their lowest setting. I saw it when I took a sip of my coffee. Two small orange orbs, just kind of floating in the tree line. I thought maybe it was something out there, like weak flashlights or something. I wasn't sure. When I turned back, something ran in front of my car. I kind of jumped in my seat and pulled off to the side of the road. There was no way I was getting out of the car especially when I was pretty sure it was just a dog or something, or maybe a big raccoon. I didn't see fur, but I did see a grayish coloring. I switched to the passenger seat and rolled the window down to at least stick my head out. I saw some movement near the tall grass, and that's when this thing pops out. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It had this peanut-shaped head. I couldn't see a mouth or even a nose. It might have had a slight bump where the nose should be, but I'm not positive on that. I definitely didn't see any nostril holes or see any breath in the air. The thing was moving on all fours with these skinny arms and legs, but it was the fingers and the toes. I remember those the best. They were really long, almost tentacle-like. They seemed to really grip the ground when they moved. It moved slowly at first, and it just stared at me. I was frozen in the window. I still don't believe what I saw. I just sat and stared back at it, trying not to move too much. I don't really know what set it off, but it seemed like it heard something in the trees. It turned its head fast in that direction, and then it took off like a bullet into the tree line. I almost fell out of the window trying to get a better look. I wanted to get out of the car. I wanted to go off into the woods after it, but something screamed in my head not to do that. I just sat there staring at the trees in the brush. I couldn't see it moving, but I saw two more pairs of eyes. Those orange orbs were its eyes. Then, two more pairs appeared, and that's when I suddenly remembered I had my phone, and I reached down for it, turned the flash on, and just started taking as many pictures as I could. They disappeared after a few minutes. I just leaned back into the car and rolled the window back up. I sat there, wiping the water off my face, just trying to figure out what the hell did I just see. I looked at the pictures on my phone, but you can't really tell what it is. It's just a flash of the trees and some pale orange orbs in the woods. It could be anything, I guess. I should have hit the zoom or something. I don't know. I just didn't think about it in the rush of things. My mind just went blank, I guess. When I switched back into the driver's seat about five minutes later, a state trooper pulled up behind my car. I rolled down the window when he came up, and he asked me what was going on. I just told him what I originally thought had happened. Either a dog or a really big raccoon had run out in front of my car, and I pulled off the road because of it. He asked me if I saw it again when I pulled over, and I said no. Must have turned off and run off somewhere. He shined his flashlight in my car, and then he told me to be careful on the roadways. I thanked him, and I watched him drive off. I quickly followed suit and got back on the freeway. I kept looking back through my rearview mirror, though, looking at that spot I had stopped at, looking to see if I could just see anything. My mind wandered the whole time I was in Hartford. I just couldn't seem to concentrate on anything work-related. I just kept remembering what I saw. I even had to question myself if I remembered everything right. I took the same route home, 
And when I realized where I was, I drove slower than I probably should have. But I kept looking out my window trying to see anything. Nothing showed up. When I got home, it took a while before I told my wife what happened. I didn't want to sound crazy. I'll never forget what I saw. I've traveled that route a hundred times since, but I've never seen anything like I did that night. I've always been a loner. It's probably most out of habit. I had a lot of illness as a kid, so I never really got to have a normal childhood with friends and stuff. Instead, I spent a lot of time in a hospital bed, and a lot more time dreaming about being part of a group like the characters from my favorite TV shows. I started getting better as I got older. By my late teens, I barely had any major hospital stays. But I was still homeschooled because my parents and doctors didn't want to put too much stress on my immune system right away. Maybe that's why I really wanted to go to college. Not just online. I wanted the whole thing. Dorm rooms, cafeteria food, walking to class, all of it. I guess I wanted to make up for lost time. When I first started, I was really nervous. I didn't really know how to interact with people who weren't wearing scrubs except for what I learned from watching TV. Turns out, I didn't have to worry so much. I met a super nice group, James, Rosalie, Sarah, and Joe. We shared some interests, and they were really cool despite my awkwardness. I really wanted to make a good impression on them so that I could become an official member of the friend group. I was hoping for an opportunity to do some sort of group activity so I could bond with everybody. I got my chance when they invited me on a camping trip. We would all carpool to the campsite, which wasn't too far away. We would spend a long weekend hanging out and sleeping under the stars. When we got to the campsite, they taught me how to set up the tents and cook camping food. We roasted marshmallows and sang some campfire songs and stargazed and told scary stories. It was just like on TV, only better because it was real. Unfortunately, not all of the evening was great. There were other groups camping in the sites around us, and one of them was really rude. I don't know what school they went to, but they were college kids like us. They partied very loudly through half of the night. James went over to talk to them, then Sarah. It wasn't just us either. A few other groups camping in the area tried to talk to them too. They wouldn't listen. It wasn't a huge deal in the grand scheme of things, but we were all annoyed that they were being so inconsiderate. So we decided to teach them a little lesson. When we were telling scary stories the first night, we found out that Joe could do some disturbingly convincing creepy monster noises. We decided to use that to freak out the rude campers by making them think there was a real monster. Joe went into the car so nobody nearby would hear and recorded several audio clips of various monster noises. He connected his phone to Sarah's Bluetooth speaker, which we would then hide near the other campsite. We then found a hiding place further away where we could see the results of our prank without them seeing us. Joe started playing the clips, and it was so funny. He started with this low growling noise. The rude campers were playing music, and they stopped and turned it down so they could hear it better. Then Joe pressed play again, and they looked at each other all nervous. We all had to bite our hands to keep quiet. We could hear the rude campers asking each other if they heard a sound. Joe kept them on edge with some ominous hissing and growling sounds for a couple of minutes. Finally, Rosalie grabbed the phone, turned the volume way up, and blasted them with this screeching roar. They all went ballistic. Everyone ran around screaming, grabbing their stuff, and running into their trailer. My friends and I were all laughing so hard as we ran away. We were walking along this kind of hill area, where the ground sort of dropped off with a moderate slope. At the bottom of the hill, it got flat again, and the trees resumed. From where we were, we could see out over the lower area into the trees. There was a denser patch of trees between us and the rude campers so we felt comfortable having our flashlights on. We were all whispering and laughing about the prank we just pulled, and we were generally in very high spirits. But then, James made a gesture which made his flashlight beam shine into the forest at the base of the slope. I just remember a flash of red eyes and a large, dark shape. We all froze, except Joe. Or maybe he just didn't believe what he'd just seen. He slowly moved his light back to where we saw this shape. I'd be willing to bet that everyone else was thinking exactly what I was thinking. That Joe had just gotten us all killed. Because there was something there. I saw a dark, hulking body. Definitely not human shape. The shoulders were too broad and looked very odd. It didn't seem to have much of a head either. Just a lump on its shoulders. With these huge red eyes. We didn't move. It didn't move. 
Suddenly, part of what I thought were shoulders shot out sideways. They were huge wings, way bigger than even the biggest birds I've ever seen. I guess they weren't for show because whatever the thing was, crouched down then shot up into the air like it was launched from a cannon. We all looked up, but somehow it had already disappeared in the night sky. I don't think any of us slept the rest of that night. I don't know about the others, but I was waiting for that thing from the forest to come back. I didn't know what I thought it would do, but I didn't want to find out. But whatever it was, it never came back. As soon as it was light, we packed up and went back to school. I don't know what that thing was, but I haven't been camping since. I had nothing against squirrels until they started coming into my house. They've always been annoying, but we pretty much let each other be. I live a bit south of Trenton in New Jersey, near Mount Holly. I assume squirrels are a problem everywhere. I don't know, because I've always lived in this area, and I haven't done much traveling. I started noticing how many squirrels were in my backyard last Halloween. I'd gotten some pumpkins, and they were all going to be jack-o'-lanterns. I'd put them outside until it was ready to carve them. Right away, they started getting chewed up, and they were ruined. Before long, the squirrels had whittled them down to nothing. I was outside looking around and saw that the big tree from my neighbor's house was growing right toward my roof. That made it really easy for the squirrels to scamper across the top of my house. I didn't think of it much, though, and I figured it was a lesson learned not to leave your pumpkin outside. Anyway, about a week after Halloween, I was in my house one night, and I heard this horrible screeching sound outside. I looked out my back window, but I couldn't see anything. My back porch light is broken. It's not just the light bulb, but something electrical, so I didn't know how to fix it. The noise was so loud and creepy. I was really starting to wonder why I was attracting all this wildlife. I couldn't imagine what could make that screeching sound. I put it out of my mind and I went to bed. But the next morning when I woke up, I was hearing some really odd thumping noises. I thought it was my neighbor working outside, but then I heard a crash outside my bedroom door. I rushed out and saw one of my wooden carvings laying on the floor. I heard a bunch of shuffling in the bathroom. And headed back there, and to my horror, a squirrel was staring back at me. I couldn't figure out what had happened. The only thing I could assume that it had gotten all the way down the chimney somehow. I yelled and it ran away from me and crawled into my under-sink bathroom cabinet. At this point, I just didn't know what to do. It wouldn't come out for anything. I left the back door open, which was really close to the bathroom. I assumed it would just automatically sense the fresh air and run out. But no dice. I played squirrel sounds for it on my phone, thinking that would entice it to come out. But nothing worked. Then, I ordered a squirrel trap on Amazon to be overnighted to me. I read that squirrels love apples and peanut butter. I crammed the squirrel trap into my tiny bathroom and set it with food inside. But that little bugger managed to get that apple out without springing the trap. Then, it went back into the cabinet and just hung out there. It lived in that cabinet for 72 hours before I was finally able to trap it and relocate it. It was traumatizing, but I was glad it was over. Until three days later when it happened again. I woke up to another one of those squirrels in my house. This time, I had secured the door to the bathroom so if it happened again, a squirrel couldn't hide out in there. I managed to get it out the back door. But it was really unprecedented to have such an unlikely thing happen again. I should mention that I was still hearing that screeching sound several days in a row now. I started wondering if there was a connection. That night, I was sitting on my couch minding my own business. I'd been hearing the screeching intermittently. Then I heard this little scurrying sound, and I looked toward my kitchen and saw this mouse just running along the baseboards. I lived in this house for over 10 years, without so much as an ant coming in. I felt surrounded and really creeped out. I got back on Amazon and ordered the mouse traps. I got my flashlight and opened the back door to see if I could tell where this sound was coming from. Even before I turned on the flashlight, I saw something big crouched on top of my back fence. The worst part was, it was looking at me. Its eyes were yellow and glowing. We had just come off of Halloween, so the impression I got was something like a goblin. I didn't even want to, but I turned my flashlight on. It was even worse than I expected. It had this elongated skeletal face, like a horse or a dragon. It had this scaly skin, too. As soon as I had turned on the flashlight, it had risen up from its crouched position and I could see that it had wings. It was terrifying to think that it might fly at me. I slammed the door closed, and that screeching started up again. 
I turned off all the lights in the house so it wouldn't be able to see me in there. I've never felt so petrified in my life. I kept trying to watch out my window to see what it would do. The neighbors behind my alley had their lights on so I could kind of make it out. After about an hour, it turned its back to my house and half jumped and flew off my fence. I couldn't tell which direction it went. There was certainly nothing I could order on Amazon for that freaking thing. I'm still pretty freaked out, and I don't even know what I would say if I tried to report it. I'm starting to think these animals were coming in my house, because they were scared of it too. I'm hoping maybe one of your listeners might have had a similar experience happen to them, and maybe some advice. I'm glad I get a chance to share this story, and really hope you read it, so that other folks can hear it. It's been really helpful listening to other people's accounts, and I finally feel like I can open up about my own experience. This all happened a few years back, and some of the other rangers still give me crap about it, which kind of sucks because other than that, this is my dream job. My family took a trip up to the North Cascades National Park in Washington State. This was when I was 13, maybe, and I've known ever since then, this is exactly where I wanted to be. When I first got out here, the Parks Commission started me out in the visitor center, pretty much like everybody else. There's an awful lot of paying your dues and dealing with the public before you get to really spend some time out in the field, which is the main reason why folks get into this. It was my first week on active field duty, and I was over the moon. Basically, you work your way across sectors of the park, camping as you go and looking to see if there's any damage left behind by private campers. It's really a great excuse just to camp your way through some incredible terrain. Now, I just want to preface this by saying that Bigfoot is kind of an open joke among the rangers. The t-shirts and posters in the gift shop are always top sellers. And I can't tell you how many times people ask me if I'd ever seen one, even before going out into the field. I can tell you now when folks ask that, everybody leans in. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Anyway, I was on duty. I was on my third day out on a scout, and I was combing my way towards Mount Shuxon. I was off the main trails, but sometimes you get really adventurous hikers out there, and they tend to leave a ton of crap behind. Whenever you're out there, you're bound to encounter a fair amount of wildlife. But I was surprised how quiet things were. There really wasn't much going on, and it was starting to get downright eerie. The only wildlife I could see was a healthy flock of scavenger birds circling to the southwest, like a lot of birds. And that's a red flag, so I started making my way over and down to check things out. When I got to where they were, they were almost overhead. This overpowering stench took over everything. Something was definitely dead out there, and it had to be there long enough to really start to decompose. Gearing myself up to see a mule deer or something else, I pushed my way closer. Eventually, I saw something large through the trees, surrounded by a half a dozen turkey vultures. What really struck me odd was that none of them were on the carcass. They hopped around it, but it was like they didn't want to get close. Fighting through the stink, I finally got near to get a sense of the shape. At first, I thought it might have been a bear, but the reddish-brown fur wasn't a match of any species in the area, and I noticed the limbs were longer than the stocky bear legs. When I was right on top of it, I completely froze. This thing had the shape of a man, but it was massive. The shoulders had to have been the better part of four feet across, and I'd estimate the full height at between eight and nine feet, maybe as large as ten, but the desiccation made it hard to tell. The hands and feet were human-like, but the skin was darker than an orangutan or a gorilla. It was lying on its front, but the head was turned to the side. So I went around to get a look. It had this humanoid face. The eyes were gone, but the features were perfectly recognizable. I immediately started shaking because I knew that I was face to face with an actual Sasquatch. It was a dead one, but this was undeniable proof that they existed. A whole rush of feelings went through me, and I was scared and giddy all at once. This was huge. I busted out my radio, but I couldn't get any kind of signal at that low point in the valley. As much as I hated it, I knew I was going to have to leave things behind and find a place where I could make contact with the other rangers. Clearing my head as best as I could, I looked around to memorize the location. 
then headed for higher ground. It was nearly a mile before I could get anything other than static. I was freaking out over getting so far from the carcass. At last, I reached one of my supervisors and told him what was up. He sounded about as incredulous as I've ever heard another person. But after about five minutes of begging, he agreed to send out a small team. I wanted to go back down, but he told me to hold in position so they could keep in contact and find me. I made camp and barely slept all night knowing these things could be out there. The next day, the three other rangers arrived. We hiked back down to the same spot where I seen the Sasquatch remains, and they were gone. The ground where it had all been still showed signs of animal decomposition, but the body itself was nowhere to be seen. They started after me and made all kinds of fun of me because I had made the call the day before April 1st. I filed a report, but they all said I was just pushing the joke and have never let me live it down since. But I swear what I saw was real, and I don't know how that body disappeared. This is an old story, but my family has me tell it almost every year. Some believe me and some don't, but that never really seems to impact how much they enjoy it. I hope you read it on your channel. There was a period of time back in the late 90s where I was the property manager for a building in downtown Houston. It was one of those places where different businesses or whatever would rent out floors or suites as their headquarters. My job was basically to be on hand and keep tabs on the cleaning stuff and generally be the go-between between between any of the renters and the owners. The place did really well overall, but they notoriously couldn't keep tenants on the fourth floor. I wish I could say something cooler like it was the 13th floor that was cursed, but this place only had nine floors, so what can you do? We were coming into the fall, and yet again, some jerk had broken their lease on the fourth floor and moved out early. They had to be out by the 15th, and it was my job to make sure they adhered to the agreement. Anytime they stayed behind or left things killed our turnover in trying to get a new tenant for the top of the next month. To make things even better, we were just coming out of a spell where one of our cleaning guys would forget to pull the door shut after sneaking a smoke out back. That, plus downtown Houston in the 90s, meant I was forever chasing teenagers out of the place. It was a real treat. One night, the janitors were done, and I had made my rounds before locking up for the night. I crossed the parking lot to the far end where my car was, and just happened to look up from my keys to see a light on. On the fourth floor, of course. Now, I might have uttered some words that aren't very nice to repeat. But after several nights that month running folks out of the place, I was in no mood for this kind of thing. Especially as I already made my rounds. And this was just dragging me back inside. Regardless, I was going to have to deal with it. So, I go back in and I take the elevator up. If I was doing my due diligence, I would have gone all the way to the top and worked my way down again to make sure nobody was on the upper floors, but I was in no mood. Besides, the lights were on the fourth floor, so the fourth floor is where I was going. When I got there, everything was bright, but nobody seemed to be around. Now, to set the scene a bit, the renters that left took all the furniture, but the phones and cubicle dividers belonged to the building. There were some that were still set up, but most were stacked against the walls. The creepy part in hindsight was that all the phones were on the floors, right where they had been set when taken off the desks. You could see the whole layout of their office structure just by where the phones were on the carpets. Anyway, I go from office to office making as much noise as possible to flush out whoever was monkeying around. Office after office, no dice, nobody in sight. On other nights, I might have gone through the entire building again but I refer you to my former statement of being in no mood. After establishing the floor was clear, I just turned off the lights and made my way back to the elevator. I hit the button and stood there, fuming. Then, all in a second, I knew I wasn't alone up there. I turned around and saw a man walk out of the corner office at the far end. He was dressed like something out of a 1950s newspaper movie or the show Mad Men, suit, tie, and fedora. He saunters to the dead center of the room opposite me and turns to stop. That's my cue to start yelling every name in the book at this guy. I start for him in a full-on huff, 
and he just does this kind of lazy walk towards me. Something about how calm he is only makes me angrier. I've crossed maybe a quarter of the room when something in my brain starts telling me that something's not right. All the lights have been cut off, but he steps into a beam spilling up from the lights in the parking lot, and that's when it all comes into place. He's got no face. I immediately start walking backwards because there's no way I'm turning my back on this, whatever it is. The elevator opened and closed while I was yelling at this guy. I reached back to hit the button, praying like hell that he hasn't gone back down into the lobby. The elevator opened and closed while I was yelling at this guy, and I reached back to hit the button. He keeps getting closer, and just when he's about 15 feet from me, every phone in the place starts ringing, even the ones that aren't plugged in. I feel like I'm going to have a heart attack at this point. The doors behind me open, and I just step backwards into the light of the elevator and hit the closed doors button. The guy approaching hasn't changed his pace at all, and the doors close just as his nothing face reaches the threshold. I book across the lobby, lock up the doors, and basically dive into my car. We secured a tenant within the next few days, and they moved in almost entirely by the 25th. I have no idea if they stayed on long term, as I handed in my resignation before the end of the month. I inherited my father's farm a few years ago and moved in shortly after with my family. I didn't grow up living with my father. My mom had full custody, and I would visit the farm from time to time, but I never lived there. The house was far back from the road and surrounded by these cornfields on all sides. There was this large two-story barn where there were a few goats, but it was mostly for storage. The house itself was a two-story house with these large windows and a nice wraparound porch. Honestly, it seemed like the perfect place to raise a family. I was excited to move in and give my kids a good childhood. I had no experience with farm maintenance, so there was quite a learning curve for me. It took a while to start getting the hang of it, but eventually I did and I really enjoyed the work. It was nice being outdoors and feeling the sun on my back while I worked. I didn't know much about tracks or footprints. But when I'd be walking through the cornfield, I noticed some tracks on the ground. They look like paw prints to me. Maybe they belong to a large dog or something. I kept seeing them for a few weeks. Every day I'd see fresh tracks. But there was no sign of the animal otherwise. One morning, I got up extra early to do my work, because it was going to be 105 degrees that day, and I wanted to beat the heat. When I was outside, I heard some rustling in the corn. I looked back and saw it moving behind me. I was a bit alarmed because I was out there alone without anything to protect me. I was just hoping it wasn't some wild animal. I looked all around me and saw that there was corn moving behind me too. I needed to get out of there so I booked it to the barn and turned around to see if it was still moving. I saw the movement going further away from where I was. I was a little confused. I thought it would have chased me but I was glad it didn't. I kind of assumed it was the dogs that had been walking around the field and didn't think much more about it. A few weeks passed and I hadn't seen anything. I kind of thought the dogs had gone away. But one night, when I was sitting on the porch relaxing, enjoying the nice cool night, I saw the corn rustling again. I stood up and grabbed a shovel that was near me on the porch, and I started walking towards it. As I approached, it quieted down. I could just make out between a few stalks of corn, this dog-like creature staring at me. I dropped down to my knees and slapped my leg to call for it. When I did, it took off in the corn and didn't look back. I noticed it had this very strange gait. I couldn't see it very well, but it almost looked like it was limping. The following night, I made sure to stay out late again to try to see if it would return. I heard more rustling in the corn, but not from in front of the house. This time, it sounded like it was near the barn. I walked down there, carrying the shovel in my hand again. I flipped on the light of the barn, and I was horrified when I saw one of my goats walking around with a bite in its neck. I rushed to it and took off my shirt and put pressure on it. I yelled for my wife, hoping she could hear me, and to call for the vet for an emergency appointment. She came running out shortly after and called. I rushed the goat to the vet, and they were able to save him but whatever it was that did that needed to go. I waited in the barn the following night, 
this time with the machete we had lying around in the house. I wasn't going to let this dog ruin my happy life on this farm. The rustling noise sounded again. I hid inside one of the barn stalls. I watched as this creature walked into the barn and stalked around. It was sniffing in the air, which I thought it must have been sniffing for the blood from the other night. In the barn, it didn't look like a dog. It didn't even look like something of this world. It was on all fours and its eyes were large and shimmering black. I thought I'd be scaring off some wild dog, not facing some scaly creature. I watched it as it sniffed the air and took notice of me. I waited in the stall and saw its feet coming closer. I kicked the stall open and heard a small squeal coming from this creature and ran back into the house. I told my wife to put the kids to bed and I told her all about what I saw. I think she thought I was crazy at first, but I got my point across. I didn't know how to get rid of this thing, or even if I could. So we ended up rehoming the goats. They all got placed on nice farms with a lot of other goats, and farmers more equipped to take care of them. Ever since we rehomed the goats, this creature stopped coming by. We have no cattle or livestock, just corn. And I suppose it's not interested in just corn. Do you know how affordable it is to fly to Indonesia? $40 for a ticket to the international airport in Medan. $40 more and a five-hour drive to Bucket Lawang, and that's it. You're in the heart of Indonesia. At least you're in the area I think of when I think of Indonesia. In every direction, a sea of green. I always wanted to experience the rainforest firsthand. $100 earned me a two-day trek through the jungle, with two experienced guides, and all the sightings of wildlife that I could imagine. I hope when we first began our journey, that I would see at least one Sumatran orangutan. They were the reason I came, honestly. Orangutans had always been my favorite animal, and I wanted to see one in person, in its natural habitat, before their critically endangered status became any bleaker. I donated where I could to help the conservation efforts, of course, but... It's hard to feel like you're making a difference when you're only one person. Looking back, I wonder if I took the trip to Indonesia because I needed to rekindle my fighting spirit or because I had already given up on saving the species. It doesn't matter. In the end, neither the orangutans nor myself became the biggest part of my story. Although, I guess it did start with one orangutan in particular. We were only an hour into the first day's trek when the lead guide raised his flat palm toward me. I stopped immediately, and the second guide, who had been following in the rear, ran ahead to join him. They pointed to the trunk of a large tree, where the vines had wrapped a coil around it and formed a second shell. Whatever they were discussing, I couldn't see it. It was just a tree as far as I was concerned. Then they waved me forward. I approached slowly, exactly as they instructed and soon my eyes landed on the object of their fascination. Around the rear side of the tree trunk, the layer of vines swelled out to create a hollow dome. Inside that dome, through the bar-like vines, I saw something large and hairy. The Sumatran orangutan. I think I yelped. I was so excited. The guides both glared at me until I quieted down. I hadn't realized it yet, but the orangutan at the base of the tree was frightened. It was hiding. Every few moments it would peek its head out from behind the vines and glance upward. We followed its vision to the canopy, but couldn't see anything out of the ordinary. No other primates, no predators. The orangutan was trembling. It didn't even notice that we were standing there. The guides ensured that we gave the animal plenty of space and we continued on our journey. I asked if that kind of encounter was odd. It felt odd. They didn't answer. We stayed silent for a long while after that only chatting when the guide stopped to point out our first sighting of a particular plant or animal. It was all fascinating, all beautiful. But I couldn't shake the memory of the wide-eyed orangutan from my head. When the sun began to set, we heard the beast that had scared that poor orangutan. Far above us, something in the canopy howled. Now, I'm no expert, but in the time since this encounter, I've tried to identify that howl. The best way I can describe it is somewhere between a cry of a wolf and a chimpanzee. It was loud, high-pitched and long-winded. When the call finally faded, 
we all stood frozen in place. The guides didn't need to explain that they'd never heard anything like that. I could see it in their slack-jawed expressions. We watched the tops of the trees, searching for the shadows for the source of that strange howl. We didn't want to move and risk provoking the animal that we couldn't see. Then, something in those shadows moved. The entire canopy seemed to sway as the thing in the darkness shifted above us. Whatever it was, it was large enough to bend those trees without a grunt of effort. I remember asking if we should run. Instead of answering, one of the guides broke into a sprint. I followed him, leaving the other one frozen in place. I like to think the guide we left behind got out of that jungle just fine. After all, the beast chased the two of us. Branches cracked and dropped from the sky, turning the dense tree limbs into a rain of foliage that fell at our heels as we ran. The creature was massive and powerful enough that it didn't need to be graceful. I tried to catch a glimpse of the animal when I could, looking over my shoulder every dozen paces as I tried to keep up with the guide ahead of me. I saw these leathery red wings, the length of a car. I saw this long snout and pointed teeth, dark eyes the size of my clenched fists, and feet with these hook-shaped claws. I know that the two of us felt like the shadow of death was upon us. The creature felt inescapable, and the jungle felt like it would stretch on forever. But just as quickly as it came, the beast was gone. The only explanation, as far as I'm concerned, was that we had wandered into its territory. Maybe it had recently moved into a part of the forest and didn't want any intruders, human or orangutan. The guide refunded me and didn't say a word. I had questions that I didn't know how to ask. Instead of asking them, I just went home. The heart of Indonesia, I learned, was a dangerous place to be. I know answers aren't coming, not without going back. It's a cheap flight, remember? Tell me you want to see what I saw, and I'll take you to the place where I found death in the jungle. This happened a few years ago when I was still in high school. I'm in college now. We all decided to do what normal, bored, suburban high school kids do when we hear about a place that we aren't supposed to go to. We got wind of an abandoned psychiatric hospital a few cities over. Urban legend had said it was haunted and creepy. As you know, people had gone crazy exploring it. Naturally, myself and my three friends needed to check this place out. I mean, I didn't believe in all the rumors and whatnot, but then again... It'd be pretty great if something did happen. So we got our flashlights and a couple of cameras. We charged our phones and got our backpacks and got everything ready for the weekend to go check this place out. There were pictures online of the place, but they were all during the day. We needed to go at night, the middle of the night if we could. The pictures were pretty crazy. It was old, run down, but I needed to see it in person, experience the place for myself. Apparently, the cops did monitor the place, so we had to be on the lookout for that too. I was not looking forward to being arrested or whatever. I don't need that in my life. We decided to go on a Sunday instead of a Saturday. Saturday is usually way more busy, you know? Whereas Sunday, people aren't out as much. At least, that's what we all decided. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Anyway, my friends came over, and we piled into my car and left my house around 10 p.m. It took about 45 minutes to get to the city of Northville, another couple of minutes to get to the hospital. I'm not going to lie, it was pretty creepy, especially at night. And I'm not the type to get creeped out by anything. It was big and janky looking. Broken windows, boarded windows, overgrown grass. It was like out of a movie. I just kind of laughed when I saw it. We kept our flashlights off going up to the building. We hadn't seen any cops, but we weren't used to the area. We weren't really sure where they hung out. I mean, they have to drive by every so often, right? We found some broken windows to get into the place. It wasn't hard. I used the light on my phone and my two friends used flashlights. They tried to point them towards the ground so that the light wasn't too bright. My other friend held his cameras to take pictures and video of our exploration. Everything was dingy and dirty and the paint was peeling off the walls. A lot of the tiled floors were cracked and broken. Things would crunch under your feet when you walked in certain areas. There was furniture and all kinds of stuff left behind. 
We found a room with stacks of old paint cans, piled up almost to the ceiling. There were old cafeteria tables folded up, tables covered with old papers and plastic containers, a room filled with like a dozen fridges. It was really weird. Like, why would you just leave all this stuff for years? There's like graffiti everywhere on the walls, like all over the place. We took a bunch of pictures of it. There was one room that had, you're not getting out alive, painted in red on the walls. That kind of freaked us out, and we just kind of laughed it off. There was one area, though, that had, I love you, on a brick wall, and that's when stuff started to get kind of weird. We're standing there taking a picture of the wall, when we swear we hear footsteps down the hall. We just stop and look at each other, and my friend Steph gets all wide-eyed. I'm trying not to laugh, and my other friends are shushing me. So I go and I look down the hallway, and I can't see anything. I mean, it's a super old building. It could be anything. And with the graffiti on the walls, people obviously come here from time to time. So we keep going. We find a couple of rooms with broken glass all over the floor, and some abandoned wheelchairs and old bed frames. We come across one room with a metal table in the middle of the room, with cabinets lining the walls. There's like holes in the table, and a rubber hose attached to it. I don't know what the hell this was used for, but we take some pictures of it, and we hear the footsteps again. We look at each other, and I swear I heard some whistling. I go and stick my head out the door and look around. I don't see anything, and now I don't hear anything. My friends started to get kind of panicky at this point, so we walk out into the hall, and then we hear something, creaking, like a door or window. That made my buddy Rob jump and I almost bust out laughing. He stops, though, and stares into his camera, and points at the screen on it. We all crowd around him, and see this shadow, like, moving down the hall. I shine the flashlight down the hall, and there's nothing. I look back at the screen, and it seems like the shadow is still moving down the wall of the hallway. Well, that was it. That sent my friends into full freakout mode, and they take off down the hallway. I go running after them, and we hear like loud crashing behind us, like things are either being flung around or smashed into each other. I don't really know. We find a room with smashed out windows, and we head outside. We were all freaked out and turned around, so it took a second to figure out which way the car was. But we ran the entire way. That shadow was shaped like a man with a long coat, I think. Some of my other friends thought it was a lady with a dress on. I really don't know, but it was definitely a crazy night. And none of my friends ever want to do anything like it ever again. It was Christmas Eve and I was running late to dinner at my parents' house. It was my first year working in retail over the holidays. And everyone and their extended families were buying last-minute gifts. I didn't expect my shift to run that far over. No rest for the wicked, I guess. My family usually gets cheap Chinese takeout for Christmas Eve. Not very exciting, I know, but I was looking forward to it regardless. I had planned to have at least an hour to go home, take a shower and make myself look presentable, but I would have to leave right from work if I wanted to make it to the party at all. It started snowing the last hour of my shift. Not enough to stick to the roads, but enough to make things pretty slippery. Great, I thought. That's just what I need, as if I wasn't already late. The drive to my parents would take about 40 minutes, but it likely would be an hour with the snow. I closed the store with another co-worker and got my car. The snow was falling in big flakes now. The parking lot was a little slippery driving, but the streets had been salted. Maybe I wouldn't be as late as I had thought. I soon left the city streets and headed towards the dark country roads. My parents didn't live in the middle of nowhere or anything, but I had to drive through a couple of towns to get there mostly on state highways surrounded by farmland. The snow was falling heavily by now, and visibility wasn't great. I remember snow sticking to my windshield wipers and freezing, so much so that I had to pull over and try to clean them off. I wasn't quite sure where I was. The visibility was pretty bad. It looked like I was near the game farm, but I couldn't tell for certain. The game farm is a big waterfowl area, super swampy and marshy. In the winter, it looks just like a normal field except for the barren, swamp trees scattered throughout. 
I squinted through the snow to see if I could make out if those were swamp trees or not. If they were, then I was only about ten miles away from my parents' house. As I was looking out at those trees, I thought I saw lights glowing from the other side of the road. They were small, sort of a reddish yellow. Just the two lights. I held my hand up to block the snow and to see if I could get a better look. By this point, I had recognized the game farm, but I couldn't see what these lights were. There was no way a person could be walking around out there. This was our first big snowfall of the season, and it hadn't been cold enough for the ground to freeze. Anybody out there would have fallen right into the swamp. The lights looked like they were moving closer to the road, but with the snow, I can't really say for sure. But that's what they looked like. I stood outside my car and watched them, trying to figure out what they could be. They went out once and then came back a second later, then twice, then three times. And then I realized they were eyes. The lights going out, whatever it was, was blinking. I jumped back in my car and locked the door. I watched it for a moment. I knew I should drive away, but I desperately wanted to see what it was. The eyes stopped moving towards me, but they stayed fixated on my car. I drove away, and whatever it was didn't try to follow me. I had all but forgotten how late I was to Christmas Eve dinner. The only thing I saw was its eyes. I didn't even see a shape of an outline or its body. I can say that it looked to be around my height, about five and a half feet tall. The snow was still falling steadily, and while I was driving slowly, I was confident that I left the creature with the glowing eyes far behind me. But I didn't even make it a half mile before something ran into the front of my car. I didn't hit the brakes because I didn't want to slide off the road. It looked big, maybe a deer. I didn't hit it, but I saw something move in the ditch on the other side of the road. I pulled over, but I didn't want to get out of the car after the incident at the game farm. So I just watched in my side mirror to see if anything in the ditch moved. It was hard to see through the snow, but it looked like this creature was getting up. It stood up on two legs, and for a split second, I thought I had just almost hit a person on the road. But then, I saw its eyes. Those same reddish-yellowish eyes from the swamp. There must be two of them, because there's no way that one could have gotten here so fast. I was driving slow, but I was still going at least 45 miles per hour. But as soon as it stood up and shook off the snow, I realized how it could have gotten here so fast and how it ran right in front of my car without getting hit. It had wings, like bird wings. I don't know, it was hard to see in the snow, but but it for sure had wings. It was too dark to see its face, but I saw its eyes and its wings. I drove dangerously fast the rest of the way to my parents' house. I'm surprised I even made it, and thankfully, this creature didn't follow me again. I don't have any other explanation for it. And I haven't ever seen it again since that night on Christmas Eve. I had a long career as a home caregiver. Home health aide or whatever they call it now. There were fewer titles when I started. I have a lot of stories to tell. Weird things happen in homes of the sick and the dying. Sometimes it felt like I was following the unexplained as I passed through the doors of a new client. That's why I was always a step behind, always reacting to the weird happenings instead of preventing them. The strangeness got there first. I was playing catch-up with the supernatural. My responsibilities included housekeeping and running errands, as well as bathing, dressing, and grooming any clients who were incapable of such on their own. I was never involved in any formal treatment or medication. My clients were either healthy enough to avoid constant medical attention or were terminal and had elected to forego any further treatment. My company called them long-term or short-term patients. Kind of cruel, but it was at least accurate. The story I want to share today is about a short-term patient, and it's about a dog. When I listed my responsibilities earlier, you'll remember that pet care was not among them. I was never asked to take care of dogs or cats or any other family pets. By the time I arrived at the home, the client had already learned that they were in no condition to take care of an animal. That was not the case here. Upon arrival, I entered the modest single-story home with a key my company provided. I called out as instructed and loudly introduced myself. The woman of the house, I've been told, was hard of hearing. 
She didn't speak much either, although I learned that after the fact. I found her in a room. She spent most of her time there, using a metal walker to alternate between her recliner and her bed. She was thin, pale, and kind of greenish looking. She had a head of wiry white hair that bunched up into a ball of tight curls. There was always a pair of elegant earrings in her ears. Her appearance, ultimately, was not that out of the ordinary. I know greenish looking sounds cruel or monstrous, but, but I assure you that with some conditions, it becomes quite normal. What was abnormal, I noticed after some time, was her earrings. I don't know where they came from. Every day a new pair. I'd help her with her bath and her wardrobe. I'd leave to make her first meal of the day and when I returned, earrings. I assumed the most basic of explanations. She was a distrustful older woman who didn't want her caregiver rummaging through her jewelry. Fair enough. What I could not explain was the dog. After that first day of work, I put the woman in the house to bed and prepared to leave. I'd be back in just 10 hours. I was eager to get home. When I opened the front door to step onto the porch, there was a large black dog waiting for me. It ran. I only saw a muzzle and a flash of mangy dark fur. A neighborhood mutt, I assumed. Maybe my client fed the animal before their condition took a turn for the worse. I silently agreed to watch out for the dog in the future and locked up for the night. Things were pretty normal after that. I cooked and cleaned and watched the reruns of her favorite 90s television shows. One night, roughly a week in, I heard the dog. I heard pitter-patter of claws on the kitchen tile floor. I ran, of course, to see what kind of animal had snuck its way into the house, but I found nothing. A quick check of the windows, and sure enough, I saw that dog running into the night. But how had it gotten inside? The windows were locked and the doors were all bolted. I made sure of it. My imagination, maybe. Maybe I heard it walking across the porch outside and thought the sound was closer than it was. I told myself that the streak of mud in the kitchen had come from my boots and not from something else. The next day, my client was noticeably more ill, bedridden from dawn to dusk, and they stayed that way for days. After laying her down early one evening, as she asked to sleep at more and more frequent intervals, I resumed a few of the cleaning tasks that I neglected throughout the day. This time, I saw it, unmistakably inside, waiting for me at the end of the hallway. It looked like a retriever, except for the matted black hair. The coat was short and curly, the snout long and eyes bright. I yelled and stepped toward it. Yet again, it fled. I tried to chase the animal to see how it was sneaking in and out of the house, but as soon as I reached the end of the hallway, it was gone. Muddy tracks carved a path through the house, but ultimately faded into nothing. I said it earlier, I was playing catch-up, always one step behind. I called my company and asked about the dog. I contacted a few distant family members of my client and asked around the neighborhood. No one knew the origins of this animal. Animal control went through the house that week and verified that there were no visible entrances of any animal, let alone an adult dog. Since the last sighting, though, the lady of the house had gotten worse. She didn't leave the bed anymore. I thought my time with her was coming to an end. Even if it was, I cut our time even shorter. One night, I entered her room, and the dog was on her chest. I saw it, and as the light from the hallway touched its body, it vanished. I stood in shock, staring at my sleeping client under her sheets, staring at the muddy paw prints on her blanket. I requested a transfer the next day. I don't know what ultimately happened to that woman. Maybe that makes this story less rewarding than it could be. But taking care of pets wasn't in my job description, and neither was chasing ghosts around a house. I chose to get out of there, and because of that, I have this and many other stories to tell. You can tell me if I made the wrong call. What I'd really like to know, however, is if anyone else has seen a dog like that. I lived in New York City my entire life. I grew up on the Lower East Side. We have a lot of pride down there, and we weren't afraid to show it. I've always loved the city, and as a kid, we thought we were the biggest stuff. I remember nodding to the police officer on our block and getting the nod back. That made me feel like such a big shot. Living in the city means that you will see some really weird stuff. It's completely unpredictable. Sometimes it's cool and happy like the big parades and New Year's celebrations. 
Sometimes it's just plain sad, like when you hear sirens start going off in the middle of the night and never stopping. It's a big city with a lot of weird stuff in it. I remember the first time I thought I saw something weird. It's nowhere near as strange as what I'm actually writing to you about. No, this one is small potatoes compared to that, but I'm going to start with the small story and build it up. I was out biking with my buddy, and it was really hot out. Our air conditioner wasn't working, so riding bikes around was basically the only way to feel any relief from the hot air. August in the city is really stifling with all the heat reflecting off the pavement and the buildings. Anyways, we were biking when I saw something in the storm drain. It was like two yellow floating lights peeking out at me. Did you ever see that movie, It? Yeah, it was like that stupid clown demon thing in the gutter, but just yellow eyes. I was riding my bike fast and didn't get a great glimpse of it. I really didn't think I thought much of it as a kid. I remembered it immediately after this last encounter, though. That bike incident happened like 20 years ago. I ended up getting a pretty good job right out of high school. I never went to college, though. School just wasn't my thing. I tried to study hard, but it never came easy. Maybe I have some bigger issue in my head, and that explains why I see these weird things. I don't know. I'm just trying to grasp at any possible semi-logical reason. Anyways, the real big potato story. So out of high school, I started working. I started working for the New York City sewer utility as basically a grunt worker. It kind of sucked, but I got health insurance and it was pretty decent pay. We didn't have much money growing up, so it was a pretty good job. Eventually, I got good at my job, and the bosses noticed that. They say hard work pays off, and it sure did for me. I eventually got upgraded to an inspector, and have basically worked by myself ever since then. New York City has a sewer system called a combined sewer. About 60% of all the sewers in the city are this combined sewer. And that means that all the little sewers and drains that come out of the buildings feed into one really big pipe. I spent a lot of time alone in those really big pipes, making sure that they'd be ready in case of a big storm, like Superstorm Sandy. So this really brings me to the whole reason why I'm writing to you now. I was down in one of these big combined drains all by myself, just like any other day. I was having a good time that day and moving pretty fast. I wanted to get out of work early to take my mom to the doctor. These combined sewers were usually pretty dry, unless it's right after a big storm or something. It hadn't rained in a week or two, so it was unusual that this combined sewer had the amount of water in it that it did. It was a solid two or three feet of extra water, and that's the first weird thing that stuck out to me. The second weird thing that stuck out to me was there was obviously something moving around in the water. I had to deal with this before. People's cats fall down the drain, or a raccoon gets stuck, or something like that, and I have to call animal control to have them remove it. I thought that's what all the ripples were. It's pretty dark down in those sewers, but I could tell that whatever was moving in that water was bigger than a raccoon or a household pet. I tried to shine my light on it, and when I did, I saw something really weird. It was scaly and spiny and moving fast through the water. I totally froze when I saw that, with all the stories of the alligators in the sewers coming into my head. I beamed my light on and watched it as it moved down the sewer tunnel. Eventually, the angle wasn't right, and I couldn't see it anymore. There was lots of debris in the water, and I really second-guessed myself, thinking maybe it was a branch or something. I know that it wasn't because of what I saw next. Remember those yellow eyes I'd seen as a kid, looking at me out of the sewer? I swear they were looking at me again, like a hundred feet away, straight out of the darkness, and it wasn't just one set of eyes. I swear I counted five sets of them, all yellow staring straight out at me, making eye contact with me. I'm pretty sure I saw one of them blink. I had never moved so fast through a sewer tunnel. I went up that ladder across the parking lot and right into my truck. My heart was pounding as I sat in my truck. I got another inspector to check out that tunnel with me. He swears he didn't see anything. This is maybe why I think I have something wrong in my head. I can't find any explanation to what I saw. I've always been sensitive to things that others can't see or hear. My mom used to think I was just making up stories to scare my siblings, but I wasn't. Growing up, we all had chores. We were a big family. I was the oldest of six kids. It was just normal to have chores, 
and being cranky about doing them was pretty typical, too. This particular night, though, nothing was typical. I was washing dishes, minding my own business. Everyone else was in bed, which was pretty normal. I wasn't able to do my chores until after the kids went to sleep, because so much of my time was spent with helping them. I kept hearing heavy footsteps behind me, which I tried to ignore. I knew that it wasn't anything that I could control, so I ignored them. Even though I had a pit in my stomach, I just kept working. I was so used to the strange and unexplainable things happening that I refused to let it phase me anymore. I had told my mom about the weirdness several times before, but she just blew me off. She would tell me that I have a vivid imagination. But that night, things changed. The footsteps had started getting heavier. Whatever was making them was angry. But I still refused to turn around. Soon, the footsteps were right behind me, and I was struggling to ignore them. I knew they were there. I knew it was angry. It didn't like being ignored. I continued to focus on the last few dishes I had. I was close to being done and able to head myself to bed. As I rinsed the last pan, all of the cabinet doors flew open. I gasped and jumped, spinning around and searching the room for anything that could have caused it. Of course, there was nothing there, except my mom in her doorway glaring at me. I quickly explained that it wasn't me, and I closed the cabinets apologizing for the noise. She sighed and sat down on the recliner. Apparently, she was going to watch me finish my chores because of the noise. I had just started wiping down the countertops when the footsteps started again racing back and forth behind me, getting louder with each pass. I looked over at my mom, who looked incredibly confused. But before she could finish her thought, every cabinet door flew open and every drawer slammed open. I yelped and jumped away from the sink, shaking as I tried to calm down. I had dealt with the footsteps for months, but this was the first time it had ever gotten physical with anything substantial, and I didn't know what to expect. Even though I was scared, I closed all the cabinets and drawers, hoping that this was the last activity for the night. But as soon as I stepped back to the sink to rinse my rag in my hand, the drawers flew open and dumped all over the floor. This time I screamed. The knife drawer was closest to the sink and narrowly missed my bare feet. My mom jumped up and ran into the kitchen. She was obviously shaken. We didn't speak as we started to put the kitchen back together. I don't think there were words for what we were feeling. I knew that she hadn't believed me, but how could she deny what she witnessed with her own eyes? As we finished putting the last of the silverware back in the drawer and the drawer back in its track, I asked, do you believe me now? She nodded and wiped her hand on her pants. I let her know I would finish up and she could go on to bed. No need for us both to be terrified. No sooner did my mom shut her bedroom door and the footsteps started again. But this time, I spun around and asked, What do you want? Why are you messing with me? Of course, I didn't expect a response. It just made me feel better to say it out loud. What I didn't count on was seeing a figure standing there. He was about six feet tall, had on an old business suit, like the ones you see in old westerns and a top hat. He was there, but he wasn't, if that makes sense. I could see him, but I could also see the table through him. He only looked at me for a moment, and then he started pacing again. I couldn't move. I was just watching him as he paced back and forth. I wasn't sure what to do, but I didn't want to draw any more attention to myself. It was only a few minutes before he just disappeared. One second he was there, and the next he was gone. That was the only time I ever saw the man, but I heard his footsteps every night until we moved. At some point, they just became a normal part of my night. I never ignored him again, though. When I would hear him start pacing, I would always say hello. I knew that he could mess with physical objects, but he never did again. I'm not sure if that's because I acknowledged him or if he just didn't find the answer he thought he would by scaring me. I still can't believe what I saw all these years later, and sometimes I still wonder if I dreamed it all up. I hope that if you read this, someone can relate and will let me know that they believe me. Because even though my mom helped me, she never once talked about it to me. So I've been left knowing this happened, but not knowing how much of my memory is exaggerated. I know it sounds crazy. I really do, but I needed someone else to hear my story and possibly understand. I'm not a professional fisherman, 
But I'd like to think of myself as a pro, because I take it very seriously, and I do it every chance I get. Let's just say I go fishing any time I'm not at my day job. In a similar fashion, I have fished in many places, but my favorite places to fish are rivers and lakes, and in my state, that usually means going to the mountains. I'm very good at what I do. I never come home without some fresh trout in my hand. So when I returned from this particular trip without any fish, my wife was very confused as to why. I've never experienced anything like this before, and I've been to the mountains countless times. I know the wildlife. I know the layout of the land. But what I saw on that trip made me fearful to ever return. It was getting close to late fall, early winter, when I decided to take a few days' trip up into the mountains. It's really my last hurrah for the year. I wanted to stock up for the winter. I took four days off, but I only planned to be gone for two. I love being outdoors, but not when it's frigid, so I wanted to come back home in decent weather. I packed up my things and said my farewells, and I started driving towards my favorite fishing spot. The wind was pretty cold, but the sun was out and shining, and the sky seemed pretty clear. Getting to my favorite fishing area was a bit of work because it's not easy to find unless you know where you're going. It's not much of a fork in the road, but it looks like it if you look hard enough. And I always take the less driven path to the left, the way you can't easily spot. I don't really take people to this spot. It was a secret fishing area that my dad would take me to, and I like to keep it private. Anyways, I take the left path on the fork in the road. And I drive a ways until I see a small clearing and the river. I unload all my things, including my tent. I get my hooks in the water as quickly as I can. Being up there usually gives me time to avoid thinking too much. I usually watch the ripples in the water, or I watch the sky change colors. I hadn't gotten a bite by the time the sky started changing pink. I was growing a little frustrated, but I knew I'd have the next day. Especially that early morning to catch something. I caught myself really looking at the trees for the rest of my time. They just looked really nice in the lighting. I'm kind of mad I hadn't really noticed them before. So anyways, I'm looking at the trees across the river from me. There's plenty of them to hide something like a deer or what have you. But the trees weren't very tall, especially not by the riverbed. A lot of the trees had burnt down a few years prior, so there were areas that seemed to be a little more bare than nature intended. It seems like I'm babbling, but a lot of this is really important for you to understand. You see, I'm as skeptical about things as anyone, but what I saw wasn't a deer or a bear. As I'm looking out towards the trees across the river, I can see between the trees, especially towards the tops of the smaller trees closest to me. But going back, it seemed to get more dense, and then a little beyond that, it was sparse again. There were holes, you know. Gaps between the dense trees. Anyways, I'm looking out and I see something that looks low to the ground. It's in the sparse area several feet from the river. But there's a lot more trees in front of it than I realize. At first, I thought I'm looking at a bear cub. Something small and dark. Much darker than a deer. And it's not really moving. So that seemed odd. I'm not a scientist, but I do know that bears don't really sit idle. They move, especially little clubs. They've got places to be. So the longer I'm looking at this dark, hairy mass, the more I'm starting to wonder what it's doing. I notice my fishing pole starts to rattle a little, so I reach my hand out to grab it. As soon as I do this movement, I notice the dark thing moves, so my reflexes cause me to look back up towards it. The thing was much closer now, standing in front of the dense area that was hiding it before. As I said, the trees in front of the dense area were pretty short, so when this thing moved forward, I could see that it was much larger than I thought. It seemed to be standing on its hind legs, but it was crouching down to meet the tops of smaller trees. The only reason I know this is because I could see what appeared to be fingers wrapping over the tops of its knees. Aspen trees don't have much to them, especially not near the base. So even though the thing thought it was hiding, I could see lots more of it than it must have thought. 
What really freaked me out were the eyes looking at me from atop of that small tree. They were dark, just like the hair on it, but they seemed much more deep, like they were curious. It didn't seem threatening at first, so I tried to walk closer to the river without looking away. But as soon as I stepped closer, it stood straight up and disappeared back into the dense trees behind it. That thing towered over the juvenile aspen. If I had to guess, I'd say the aspen was around four or five feet tall, and this thing was nearly twice its size. But it glides into the trees with ease, like it was used to be hidden away, despite how big it was. I know it sounds crazy, but whatever it was looked more human than a beast, especially in those eyes. And with that, I decided to pack up all my things and go back home. I didn't even spend the two days that I had planned. Greetings, Donovan. I love your channel. It's always given me a thrill hearing about the scary happenings people have experienced in the secluded parts of the world. I can't say I ever expected to have one of those experiences myself, but I did. I live in the heart of Philadelphia, a few blocks north of the center city, just before it starts to get too sketchy. It's always busy and always crowded, so I never expected to come across anything like what I've seen in your videos. It all happened on what was easily the worst day of my life. I've had some issues with drinking throughout my life, and I'm proud to say that I've been three years sober. This past February, I almost poured it all down the drain. I was in Fairmont, near where my girlfriend and our son live with her parents. Both her mom and dad are lawyers that work for a law firm that defends other lawyers. So they live in a real nice townhouse on North Woodstock Street, right behind the Eastern State Penitentiary. If you're not a Philly native, you've probably still heard of the old prison. It was once the most expensive prison in the world and held notorious criminals like Al Capone, but is now just a historic landmark most famous for being an elaborate haunted house around Halloween. I didn't live with my girl and son because we couldn't all fit in my tiny apartment, and her parents were not a big fan of mine. It sucked, but the schools around her parents' neighborhood were fantastic, and I wanted to give my son the best chance he could at not being a screw-up like me. Me and my girl were having a knockdown drag out fight that night, and we broke up. I was in a bad place. I stormed out of the house and walked down Fairmont Avenue looking for a place to drink. Sobriety didn't matter to me anymore. It was still too early for most of the bars to be open, and I wanted to get a whole bottle to myself anyways. So I headed to the nearest store. Unfortunately at the time, but fortunately for me in the long run, the closest store was not open. I was beyond annoyed, so I kept my eyes peeled for a bus station so I could leave the neighborhood. I found one at the end of the street and waited impatiently in the cold. I was still simmering from my fight with Michelle, so I really didn't care anymore where I went. I was intent on jumping the first bus that came by and getting away from the area. A SEPTA bus finally came rolling down the street, but the LCD display board on the front of the bus was blank. It didn't show any destination. Normally, they say off-duty if they're not on route, so I assumed it was just busted. It rumbled to a stop at the bus stop. I walked towards the door, but the unmarked bus started to speed off. I was pissed and chased it down the street. I picked up cans and gravel off the street and threw them at the back of the bus. After about a half a block, the bus stopped, and the door opened. I was surprised. I didn't expect it to stop after the hissy fit I just threw and I wasn't sure if I should actually get on. My anger from the fight with Michelle overtook my caution, and I walked onto the bus. I tried to pay, but the driver just smiled and jerked his thumb to the back, indicating for me to take a seat. By all accounts, the bus looked normal, but everything was off. It was all so indistinct. I still can't picture the face of the driver. I couldn't tell you his hair color or really anything. I sat near the back of the bus. There weren't many people in the bus, but everyone I passed looked just as miserable as I did. Like this bus was a vehicle for people at their lowest point. I didn't see a single smiling face on the entire bus. We rode for hours, passing indistinct neighborhoods. It all looked familiar, but I couldn't place any local landmarks. 
It felt like I was touring a movie set built to look like Philadelphia, but wasn't the actual city. I felt an overwhelming sense of lethargy. I wasn't even bothered about where we were going. Occasionally, we would stop, and someone would just stand up and get off. The people getting off looked surprised to be leaving. These looked like random spots, but those exiting the bus clearly knew their surroundings. As we drove, I replayed the argument I had with Michelle over and over again in my mind, realizing what I should have said or shouldn't have said. Maybe I had been too harsh and defensive. Maybe I need to be more understanding. We only picked up one person while I was on the bus. It played out very closely to how I got on. The bus stopped and then sped off, leaving the poor soul to chase us down the street. What really struck me, though, was how he seemed to be the only one in the crowd to notice us. There were other people at that bus stop, but they didn't seem to notice us rolling in. Hours or days later, I honestly couldn't even tell you. I had an epiphany. It was a crystallizing moment of clarity, where I knew exactly what I had to do. Just as the thought burst into my mind, the bus stopped. I looked out my window and realized we were back on Fairmont. The look of surprise on the other passengers' faces, just before they got off the bus, suddenly made sense to me. I ran off that bus and knocked on the door to my girlfriend's place. She ripped the door open instantly, like she had been standing right at the doorway. Her clothes were the same as when I left her, and everything looked exactly as it had when I left. I told her everything that went through my head on that strange bus, and we're still together to this day. I don't understand what happened, but I know it somehow gave me a second chance. I never did believe in the supernatural. Truthfully, I still don't. Maybe that's why it's so hard for me to square away what I saw in 06. It's like a black stain on my perfect portrait of faith. It's something I can't explain. I hope that you can. If not, maybe you can point me towards someone with a theory. All of my theories have run their course. Do you remember 06? An ice storm came through central Illinois that shattered trees and encased entire houses. We had to chisel our way out of the front door. The way I remember it, we got hit at the tail end of November or the first week of December. It's hard to say. Either way, for the next month, we were in a purgatory of ice. Then, we got hit again in January. That one, I'm sure you remember. It wasn't exclusive to any one state. Most of North America felt that one. For a while, it seemed that winter wasn't going to end. Global warming had really come for us, huh? Of course, it did end. The ice melted and we went back to our usual lives, forgetting that more than 70 people were killed by that ice. Is 70 a lot? It feels like a lot. Either way, this story isn't about those 70 people. Maybe it should be. I know we've had some storms just as bad since then, and it never feels like the country is really prepared. I don't want to get into politics, though. I don't want to talk about how much our taxes go towards crisis spending, and I definitely don't want to debate the existence of global warming. I don't drink myself to sleep every night trying to forget that the ice caps are melting. I'm trying to forget what I saw. We had a few weeks to prepare, right? A few weeks when we all talked about the weatherman and doubted that his predictions of the record-setting low temperatures would come true. We doubted him, but we emptied the stores anyways. We all do a bit of panic shopping, don't we? We hear we might be stuck indoors, and suddenly, all we can think of is hoarding as many resources as we can. Stock up the cupboards, fill the fridge, stack the cans in the basement. It was right after Thanksgiving. I remember because I was looking in the fridge, trying to decide whether or not my leftovers would carry me through the storm that was coming. I decided to grab a few groceries in the middle of the night just to be safe. I didn't count on the main roads being closed. I didn't count on the detour keeping me out so late. I certainly didn't think the storm would arrive while I was behind the wheel. It did. I ended up parked on the side of the road. My hazard lights reflected in the falling snow and ice, illuminating the area around me one beat at a time. Each time the light blinked on and unveiled the world around me, the road and the fields were covered by more freezing white. 
I was being buried. Luckily, by then, I had grabbed my groceries. I zipped up my jacket and worked my way through a candy bar. It turns out stress eating can't save you from a blizzard. I started the car to run the heat and recharge the battery. As the engine hummed back to life, my hazard lights briefly stopped blinking. There was a pause in the rhythm. It was brief and only lasted for a single moment while the car fired back up. But in that brief moment, before the hazards and the headlights could shine, another light blinked back at me. I cut the engine immediately. I pressed the triangular button that toggled my emergency lights, and I held my breath. Whatever blinked at me, it came from the sky. A helicopter? Not in that weather. I rubbed my eyes and took a deep breath, telling myself that stress was overwhelming me. All of the shadows from the storm had caught me by surprise. When I looked back through the windshield, the light blinked again. This time, it was closer. This time, I saw where it was coming from. Easily the diameter of a train car. It was floating above the road. It didn't move. It didn't make a sound. The wind and the snow and the ice didn't seem to touch it. The smooth black surface was unmarked by the winter. From my position on the road, I could only make out a single obstruction on its polished circular frame. There was a large indentation, also circular, facing my direction. It felt like I was looking at the hollow socket of a skull. It felt like there was an eye there, something watching me that I couldn't see. The light blinked again, shining from that indentation and blanketing my car. It swallowed the vehicle and blinded me. I felt the frame rumble and grabbed my steering wheel until my knuckles turned white. Something lurched underneath me, like the car was being lifted from the ground. I swayed in the mean winter wind, and then I fell. The vehicle crashed back onto the pavement. It must have only risen an inch or two, but it was enough to shake me to my core. My head bounced when I looked up. The light and the object in the sky were gone. I didn't die out there. I didn't wind up one of those 70 people. I know that makes me lucky. But I have spent every day since wondering what that was. What did it want? Why did it stop to look at me? Was it satisfied with what it saw? So it dropped the car and spared my life. Or was it disappointed, so it cast me back into the storm and let Mother Nature decide my fate? Like I said, I don't believe in the supernatural. I need you to tell me what was natural about what I saw that night. Hey Donovan, if any of your listeners are from Maine, then they might be interested in this. Over the summer, I was canoeing on the Saco River by myself just to get away for a few days. Sometimes you've just got to clear your head and not hear people's voices. You know what I mean? Although at the end of this trip, I was wishing I'd brought someone with me, just so that I'd have someone to back me up, that it really happened. I did have my dog Bo with me, but he's not much good as a witness. It started out pretty pleasant. If you've never been on the Sacco, then you need to give it a try. There's a lot of sandbars you can just pull up your boat and pitch a tent. My plan was to find a good spot and stay put there for two nights, but I left after the first one. Bo's real good about sticking close to me. He's a black lab, and you know they're in heaven around water. I had been paddling for about a half an hour, but I could tell Bo was itching to swim, so I told him, okay, I was good to let the current take me downstream for a bit just using the paddle to keep myself from turning sideways. Bo would swim to the shore and race around, popping out and checking to see where I was. Then he'd jump back in the river and swim near the boat for a bit before doing the whole thing all over again. He was happy as a lark, big goofy dog grin on his face. At one point, I heard him start barking when he was on land. I whistled and called him, clapping my hands to get his attention. It took a few minutes, but he showed up on the shore. He just sat down and looked at me, which was unusual. I mean, him not swimming out to me. So I thought maybe he's tired and I paddled into shore. I got out to go relieve myself in the woods. But the minute I started to head away from the bank, Bo got all anxious, running around me and barking. I couldn't tell what was going on with him, but he was mighty jumpy. I had to wonder if maybe he'd seen a snake or something. Sometimes a big enough snake will get him acting wild. 
I just walked over to the nearest tree and did my thing, telling him to calm down. When I started to walk back to the boat, I saw something a little strange on the sand. There were half a dozen dead fish laying there, with only the bellies eaten out. Kind of strange because just about any animal I know would eat the head too, even if they left the tail. But these all just had half-moon-shaped bites taken out of them, so I was a little puzzled by that. There weren't too many flies on them yet, so it must have just happened fairly recently. After a minute, I just put it out of my head, getting Bo all settled in the boat and shoving off. He seemed content just to be a passenger at this point, sitting in the bow and keeping an eagle-eyed watch on the right-hand bank. We found a good sandbar not long after that, and I was ready to be off the river. I beached the boat and tied it, and Bo jumped out, sniffing around while I unloaded my gear. He was sticking pretty close to me, even though I told him, go on, it's okay. Usually when I tell him that, he's just like a little kid at recess and just runs off and explores. But he hung out with me while I pitched the tent. It was pretty darn relaxing, not having anyone around, just me in the river and my dog. That evening, I was kicked back by the fire when Bo started acting weird again. He ambled over to the riverbank and was standing there with his tail tucked down, just whining. I called him a few times, but he wouldn't come, so I finally walked over there to see what was up. I couldn't see a damn thing staring out at the river in the dark, but then I heard some splashing, and it sounded big, not like a fish. That had me wondering if there was a bear nearby. They're pretty good swimmers, you know. I already had my food hung in a tree, but I made Bo come back with me to the fire just in case. He was acting really nervous. And within a few minutes, he went to the tent door and just stood there whining. I've got a two-room tent, and I always have Bo sleeping in there with me. I wondered if maybe he wasn't feeling well, that he wanted to go inside so early. It's usually the other way around. I get in there with him, and he whines to go back out. I was pretty beat, so I didn't stay up much longer. Bo had laid down right in front of the tent, and he was happy when I joined him. We got inside and settled in, and I fell asleep straight away. I woke up with the light shining in and Bo barking his head off. He looked at me when I sat up and he started whining. So I unzipped the tent thinking he had to pee. While I was still getting dressed, I heard a big splash and Bo yelped. Frantic, I stumbled outside without my shoes on because he sounded hurt. And he was. He loped over to me and he had this big scrape down his foreleg that was bleeding. I looked around but I couldn't see any threat. So I ducked back into the tent and grabbed my first aid kit and a bandana. Poor Bo was trembling all over while I cleaned and dressed his wound, wrapping the bandana over a gauze pad. It didn't look too bad, but I wondered what it could have been. It looked like he had been clawed, not bitten. Maybe a raccoon, I thought. I went back over to the river and looked out, but I didn't see anything. Still, with my boy getting scraped up, I felt like we better pack it in. He stayed right by my side while I tore down the tent and packed the boat back up, a sure sign he was feeling bad. As I got into the boat with Bo riding in front, I thought I saw something move just beneath the surface of the water, about 15 feet out. Just the way the surface rippled, strange, but I thought I imagined it, so I shoved off. No sooner had I started paddling than I felt the boat bump into something, a log I thought. But then suddenly we were violently wrenched sideways, almost like something had grabbed us. I turned to look and there was this thing. I don't even know what it was. It was something like out of a B movie. Only part of its head was above the water, less than 10 feet from us. The head was as big as a man's head, but reptilian looking, all bumpy with scales. It had these big bug eyes completely black and it was submerged up to its eyes. I couldn't see the rest of it, but I didn't need to. It was scary as hell. Bo started whining and growling, but then kind of hunkered down like he didn't want to be seen. I had to think that maybe this thing was what he had gotten to a scuffle with. I'll tell you plain, I was scared to death. So I just started paddling hard, getting away from it, wondering how fast that thing could swim. It stayed right where it was, though. Thank God, it never came after us. I don't know what the hell that was. I've never heard of any creature like this. It had me question my sanity. At one point, I had to wonder if it was someone in a rubber mask. But there was no one around. No boats that morning at all. It would ease my mind a little if someone else had seen or heard this creature. 
so speak up if you have. By the way, Bo's fine. His cut healed up with no problem, but we're going to find another river. Hi, Donovan. I saw something recently that I found pretty horrific. I hope you don't mind me using your platform to tell my story. It's the only way I can be safe when I report what I saw. Once this is out in the open, I know that no one can come after me. My friend and I have a client in our landscaping business who's pretty high up the totem pole. He has a high-profile job and a lot of rich friends. This story isn't about him. He's actually pretty cool. He doesn't act like he's better than anyone else because he drives a fancy car or has a lot of money. We did a pretty extensive job for him over the summer. He's got acres of land and had a swimming pool put in, then hired our company to completely enclose it with shrubs and trees because his ex-model girlfriend likes to sunbathe in the nude. I know, right? This guy has it made. It took us most of the summer to complete the job. He was very specific in what he wanted, but we were glad to have such a big job. He's a great client and gave us a huge tip. Then he invited us to a party his friend was having on Labor Day. He said the guy was a really well-known photographer and had a huge estate out in the middle of nowhere. He told us there would be a lot of chicks and free booze and other stuff too. Neither one of us had any big plans for the weekend, so we were like, sure, why not? It seemed like it would be a really fun way to officially end the summer season. Boy, was I wrong. Now I'm having nightmares about what I saw, and I'd wish I'd never gone to the damn thing. When we got there... We were both really wowed by the size of this guy's estate. He had these fancy wrought iron gates at the end of a long driveway, and it was my first time having to use an intercom to announce ourselves so the gates would open. It felt like something out of a movie. We parked my buddy's 2000 Honda CRV in the middle of a bunch of snazzy sports cars and took a few minutes to admire the fancy rides. I took a few pics with my phone to show my dad. I knew he'd be impressed I'd be rubbing elbows with these folks. I was afraid that we'd stand out like a couple of sore thumbs, and things would be awkward, but once we got up to the house, which was packed, everyone was really cool and friendly, and made us feel welcome. It was a hell of a party. Top shelf booze, lots of model chicks, and a live band playing, and a table of other recreational enhancements, if you know what I mean. My buddy and I don't touch that stuff but it was still mind-boggling to see how much dough this guy was throwing away to keep his guests in high spirits. Everything was going good until we chatted with the party's host, younger brother, a guy in his late 20s. He was all about, let me show you this, and check out my brother's collection of type of stuff, kind of showing off. He says to me out of the blue, hey, you believe in Bigfoot? I'm thinking it was an opening to a joke. So I laughed and said, I don't know, should I? He said, no, I'm serious. You know a lot of people say it's not real. Do you believe it's real or not? I shook my head and said, probably not. And my buddy chimed in saying, absolutely not. Urban legend. The guy gets this funny look on his face and says, I bet you a hundred I can change your mind. I didn't know what to think, but I wasn't about to bet a hundred bucks on anything. I just shook my head and smiled. My buddy said, I'll bet you 20. That's all I got on me. The guy just grins and says, it's a deal, follow me. He turns and heads through the house, winding through all these people. My pal just looks at me and shrugs and follows the dude, so I went too. This house was huge. I don't know, maybe 8,000 square feet, just a guess. So we walk for a minute and we finally get away from the crowd and come to this locked door. The guy has a key, and when he opens it, I can see its steps leading down to a basement. The smell coming up from the basement was gross. It smelled like a zoo. I must have shown on my face what I was thinking. Because the guy laughed and said, Oh, it's not that bad. Come on. You'll see. It's worth it. Just breathe through your mouth. I looked at my friend like, What have you gotten us into? He shrugged and followed the guy down the stairs, with me right behind him. As soon as we got down there, I saw what made it smell so bad. This guy was keeping a bunch of exotic animals in cages in his basement. He had a white Siberian tiger, a bunch of really big snakes, and something I didn't really recognize for sure. I think it was a sloth. I felt really bad for the tiger. It had a chain around its neck, even though it was in a cage, and it looked miserable. It didn't even move when we walked by, 
like it had gone somewhere else in its head to escape. But all my thoughts about that poor animal flew right out of my head when I saw what was in the last cage. It was pretty small, like it was a young one. But I swear to God, this thing looked like a Bigfoot from the movies. It was in a cage, but just like the tiger, it had a chain around its neck too. And it was afraid. When it saw the guy, it kind of cowered back. It was covered completely in fur except for its face and hands and feet. It had a prominent brow ridge like a caveman, but it had human eyes. It was freaky as hell, but I had to feel bad for it. The cage was filthy, and the thing was terrified. So what do you say now, the guy said, with his big grin on his face. I was speechless. My buddy said, holy crap, where did it come from? He pulled out his money and paid the guy. The guy got really cagey about where. Just said his brother has connections all over the globe, and he paid a really high price for it. I was feeling kind of sick from the smell. I guess I looked green because the guy said we should go back upstairs. When we got to the staircase, he turned around and warned us. You can't tell anyone about this. If word gets out, I'll know it was you guys. And my brother knows how to make people just disappear. He was deadly serious, I could tell. That party was back at the beginning of September, and I haven't told anyone until now. I just feel like the conditions this thing was being kept in was inhumane. It's really bothering me. I've decided that I'm going to go to the authorities. I'll tell them where the house is. Maybe you guys will see this story in the news soon. I hope this story here will protect me from any retribution. The more people that share this story, the more my mind will be at ease. They can't stop all of us, right? Thanks, Donovan. I like to consider myself a pretty sensible person. I'm never too erratic or overreacting to situations. If I'm wrong, I take accountability for my actions. So I have no reason to feed into any conspiracy-fueled nonsense. What I witnessed the summer I retired from 30 years of fighting wildlife almost scared me half to death. It was something straight out of horror films my kids love to watch so much. The very things I've always told them not to be afraid of was right in front of my face. It was my dream after retirement to move back to my hometown, right outside of Fresno, California, near the river. I wanted to feel at peace in a slightly more rural area, while still being accessible to the city. I was still near my kids, able to see them at any time that I wanted. My dreams of a peaceful life, fishing in my backyard, sitting on the porch playing Sudoku in the morning, were coming true. I could finally be at ease. The only fires left to fight coming from the stove after my cooking attempts. I closed on a home and started moving my things back and forth from Los Angeles. It was bittersweet, of course, as I had many friends there who wouldn't be right up the street from me anymore. Then one day, my friend of 10 years started prying into my intentions for moving. They seemed to be pressed about Fresno specifically for some reason. I wasn't sure if it was due to personal experience with people or them just not wanting me to go. After beating around the bush, they got to the point where there's this old tale of something in Fresno that was really freaky, as they put it. Again, I'm a sensible person, so when I hear tall tales, they don't faze me much. Not even pictures always influence my opinion. Since we've been friends for so long, I still valued their opinion and understood it must be serious if they brought it up. So I listened to their story of an old spouse whose family lived around the same lake I was moving near. One morning while waiting for the school bus, he saw some crazy-looking thing running full speed on all fours. At this point, I was tuned out, not wanting to believe any recollection of something 30-plus years ago as seen by a child. The reality is, children are more likely to witness supernatural beings and accept them as real because they haven't been conditioned to believe otherwise. I listened to them explain the psychological impact it had on them as a child. While empathizing... I could not see myself changing my mind about moving simply based on this. They understood my decision and respected it, saying they figured I'd probably have to see it to believe it. Regardless, they helped me pack and sent me on my way. Three weeks later, I moved in completely, ready to begin the rest of my life. At first, it took some getting used to. I was seeking the adrenaline rush from firefighting, which I miss so much. Normally, I'm a homebody. I found myself wanting to get out of the house more often. So I started looking for new hobbies to try out. I found a painting class in town, which felt perfect. Three days later, I went to my first class, making a few friends right off the bat. 
We were assigned to do this freestyle painting session of anything of our choice. We had dividers between us to make sure every idea was original, and nobody could mistakenly feed off each other's ideas for inspiration. We still had conversation, just not about what we were painting. I told him I was new in town, which sparked a million different conversations about the area. We talked about everything from good restaurants, good places to hike, and places to avoid. Even though we had just met, I felt that I could trust what they were saying. The words seemed to come with wisdom and experience. Before I knew it, we had been talking for about 25 minutes, and it was time to share what we had painted. I went first as the newbie, showing the fiery scene of a forest fire being doused with water. I told a short story of its inspiration, explaining the recent end of my career. A few people later, a younger man showed his painting of a pale naked being on all fours. Once again, I was faced with another story of someone with either first-hand experience or knowing someone who had seen it. I couldn't help but to start to feel a little weird at this point. Everyone couldn't be lying. I was running out of excuses not to be at least a little scared of seeing this thing. I could no longer blame just a child's imagination for it. This thing was way more common than I expected. Two weeks later, I was sitting on the porch doing a Sudoku puzzle. Something scurried through my yard. My full focus was on my puzzle book, but my peripheral still caught it. Frozen, I could not have moved if I tried. Of course, the creature was on my mind. It never left. So I stood up, trying to get a head start in case I had to run suddenly, grabbing my phone to make sure it was on silent, to avoid drawing attention to myself. Then, I stood there waiting to see if it would come back. I heard these tapping noises, like someone chopping wood nearby or something. Then, there it was again. It zoomed across my yard so fast I could barely see it well. It was so human-like, yet no human could physically be able to move that fast on all fours. It wasn't furry or feathered like an animal, nor did it move like one. It made no sense whatsoever. Not only were its movements non-human-like, but its face looked like something out of Insidious. No human has fully black eyes with no pupils. Not that I had time to overanalyze its facial features, because by the time I saw the face well, I had dropped my book and ran into the house. Turns out my dream of beginning the rest of my life had to be rewritten, because crawling creatures was not part of it. I rented the house out immediately, moving back to Los Angeles for the time being. I told my friend what I saw, and all they could say was, I told you so.